So the early Bronze Age and the early Iron Age in this area is characterized by cultural and economic changes. They were part of a shifting process that was deeply linked to the uh, changing control of copper ore in finance over time. So uh, moreover, also recent research has provided a better understanding of the role of both semi-nomadic and nomadic populations in the evolution of complex societies and metallurgy in this region. So the aim of the present project is to document and study the traditions of ceramic manufacture and use at several previously surveyed and excavated settlement sites, dating from the early Bronze Age 3 to 4 to the early Iron Age. Uh, basically, the research questions can be summarized into three main topics, composition, provenance, and technology. So some of these questions include like, did any of those change over time? That is, for instance, where the ceramics manufactured at those sites or were imported from elsewhere. Also, can different pottery making traditions be recognized on the basis of composition and technology? And also, like, how is the pottery production organized in every period? Like, for instance, where the clay and raw material sources located near the sites? And then also, what was the role of a pottery production in the development of the so-called complex societies in southern Jordan? And to what extent did pottery production contribute to the development of copper metallurgical production? For instance, like where the raw, uh, raw materials and clay sources located near copper ore mines. And also like uh, we will analyze some technical ceramics, mainly molds, to see whether the composition is either similar or different to that of non-technical ceramics. So the scientific analysis will be carried out within the framework of the research conducted in this region by the University of California, San Diego, and the Department of Antiquities of Jordan since the early 90s. So an integrated approach will be taken to combine the data obtained by several different uh, scientific techniques, including the microscopic study of the ceramics, thin section petrography analysis, and other compositional analytical techniques, mainly PXRF, LAICPMS, SAMEDS, and XRD to characterize the geochemical and mineralogical composition of the ceramics, determine their provenance, and try to shed light onto the technological steps and skills involved in their production. So the sampling of the archaeological ceramic assemblages took place at the University of California, San Diego Levantine Archaeology Lab in May 2022, under the supervision of Dr. Marjorie Barton and Professor Thomas Levy. So the ceramics analyzed were collected during uh, several different projects carried out by UCSD and the Department, Department of Antiquities of Jordan. So as one of the aims of the present project was to document and study the diachronic evolutions uh, of traditions of ceramic manufacture and use uh, from a regional perspective in this region, four excavated sites dating from the early bronze to the early Iron Age were chosen as case studies. This was due to both the accessibility of the material, but also in the interest in further explore the interaction between these sites, which has already been examined and confirmed previously using different theoretical and analytical approaches, mainly linked to archaeometallurgical studies. So during the first uh, research stay at UCSD, a total of 66 and 135 samples were selected from the ceramic assemblages of the early Bronze Age 3-4 site of Kirbat Hamrat Ivdan and the early Iron Age site of Kirbat Algeria, respectively. A uh, second trip to U UCSD is also planned for May next year uh, to further um, sample two other ceramic assemblages from the same periods of the sites of Kirbat Fainan and the early Iron Age site of Kirbat and Nahas. Um, basically, the importance of this, uh, all these sites lies on the fact that on-site evidence for copper metallurgical production has been documented, which kind of offers us a great opportunity to explore the relationship between metallurgy and pottery production. So uh, the microscopic examination took place at UCL, and to this thing, microfabrics have been identified so far within the Kirbat Hamrativ Dan ceramic assemblage. So most of these, uh, uh, the early Bronze Age samples uh, belong to the quartz tempered uh, microfabric group. Um, basically, most of the shirts are wheel made, while only a small number, a small number are handmade. Also, the presence of both calcareous and non-calcareous iron-age clay has been used to uh, classify these shirts into two subgroups, 
uh, calcareous and non-calcareous uh, quartz-tempered fabrics. So the firing conditions are very diverse. There are some shirts that are oxidized where uh, others are reduced, and also others were fired alternating both reducing and oxidizing conditions. So some of the wheel made samples are red slipped in both or one side and burnished, whereas others have black paint on the exterior and are wet smooth. Also, uh, other samples have either incised or impressed decoration. Um, not worthy, the handmade shirts uh, do not bear any slip and are wet smooth. So the shell temper fabric corresponds to wheel made and wet smooth pottery, some of which also with black paint on the exterior. Also the clay is non calcareous and light red, and the shirts were all fired in oxidizing conditions. Also both of these fabrics have been identified within the uh, early Iron Age site of Kiribati Algeria with similar characteristics. However, in, in the early Iron Age site, the shell temper fabric seemed to be the main uh, macrofabric group, sorry. And most of the shirts um, of the early, bronze, uh, early Iron Age site are also well-made and wet smooth. However, like a third macrofabric has been documented, which is a carbonate rich fabric. And this macrofabric group is constituted of handmade and wet smooth pottery with no decoration at all. Also, the clay is non-calcareous and its color ranges from light red to light gray. And also most of these samples were fired in oxidizing conditions, while only two were fired in a reducing atmosphere. Um, thin section petrography analysis has also been carried out at UCL and so far has revealed the presence of two petrographic fabrics within the early Bronze Age site of Kribahamba Diftan, the quartz tempered and the shell tempered fabrics, which seem to match the macroscopic observations. So the quartz tempered fabric is characterized by the predominance of angular to subrounded coarse, fine sun, sun sized quartz inclusions, whereas granite rock fragments and limestone inclusions are frequent to common. Also, calcite, red and gray argillaceous shells and ferruginous inclusions range from few to rare. Uh, the shell temper fabric is characterized by the predominance of gray and red argillaceous shells, and limestone inclusions are frequent to common, whereas ferruginous and calcite inclusions are rare. Also, these two groups have also been identified again for the early Iron Age site of Kiribati Algeria with similar characteristics alongside the carbonate rich uh, fabric. So this fabric is characterized by the predominant, uh, predominant presence of macro to mesa wax, that are probably indicators of the decomposition of carbonate sedimentary rock fragments during firing, as suggested by the presence of calcareous borders left from the diffusion of calcium carbonate. Also limestone inclusions are common, whereas gray and red argillaceous shells calcite quartz and ferruginous inclusions are rare. Unfortunately, right now I cannot provide like more detailed description because I've just finished making my thin sections this week. So I really haven't been like looking at them in depth. Um, for PXRF, like homogenized powder samples were made in order to try to reduce the influence of temper, but also in a recent archaeometric study by Marino et al. in 2022 that compared geochemical results uh, obtained using homogenized powder, intact shirts, and pressed planch planchets. Homogenized powders uh, yielded the most accurate and precise results. So multivariate statistical analysis was performed using log transform data to base 10 on a data set combining both sites and also two data sets uh, from each site individually. So in the combined PCA, three distinct geochemical groups seem to exist, one group with a higher iron content on the top, and then two other groups. One has a higher amount of rubidium, which is usually present in high levels in many types of shells and mudstones, and thus it could be linked to the shell tempered uh, fabric. The other group has a higher amount of potassium, which is present in biotite and alkali false parts. And thus it could be linked to the quartz tempered fabric, which has abundant granite rock fragments that contains these minerals. So the labeling of the PCA with the sites seem to reveal a certain correlation between geochemical groups and sites with some overlapping, which is kind of expected. But, and then like, um, if we compare this data with the petrographic results, 
um, it kind of makes sense because as uh, most of the early Bronze Age uh, samples fall into the quartz temper fabric, whereas most of the early Iron Age samples correspond to the shell temper one. So individually, at least two geochemical groups have been identified at each site, possibly three at Karsh, as you will see. And they also seem to confirm the petrographic observations. Uh, not worthy, the labeling of the PCA does not reveal any correlation between geochemical groups and archaeological data, which is in this case of the early Bronze Age site of Kirbalhamba Nibdan, suggests that potters um, using these fabrics were producing different types of vessels, whereas in the case of the early Iron Age site of Kirbat Algeria seems to indicate that both fabrics well, were kind of distributed evenly within the site. So uh, thus the present project will constitute one of the major archaeometric studies of pottery from the Edo of Longland region, but also in Lebanon in general, and will incorporate new scientific approaches and procedures for ceramic analysis in the region. They will aim to establish standardized protocols for archaeometric analysis, such as the use of terminology and standard petrographic descriptions, but also, and more importantly, the publication of the data sets from geochemical analysis to enable future data comparison. Also, the results will shed light onto the organization of pottery production at both at the local and regional levels at every given period which will contribute to better understand the evolution of pottery making traditions over time. Also, the observations made are uh, also expected to address the nature of any possible trade and exchange networks with other communities from both an intra-regional but also super-regional levels. And also, we will try to compare the published data from that of other Southern Levantine sites. And um, that's all. Thank you so much for your attention and for organizing all this. Sorry. Thank you, Sarah. We will leave uh, the questions uh, for the end. And now we will continue with the second uh, presentation um, given by Chase uh, Minos. Chase, please. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Chase from the Cypress Institute, and today I'm going to talk to you about my uh, PhD research uh, to date, which, uh, as the title suggests, is about uh, ceramics, and particularly with the repetition of the word technology. Uh, in essence, it will be it is a compositional study of two two to three uh, types of wares from uh, two late Bronze Age sites in Cyprus, uh, Enkuli and Iosizomenos. So the main aims of my project are to characterize the local ceramic production uh, at two uh, important sites. And the second part is to reconstruct partially the uh, production sequence of these two wares, uh, plain white handmade and well-made and red and black slip handmade and well-made. <clears throat> the research questions uh, will necessarily try to answer uh, or try to explore uh, how potters are preparing their clays, uh, the differences between these two wares and across these two sites uh, in the Masaria Valley. And of course, uh, the, second, the last part is to explore how the wheel uh, affected uh, raw, material product, uh, raw material selection and preparation. So as you might have guessed, this focus on uh, the study is focused on raw materials. So brief uh, uh, comments about the geology of Cyprus. Uh, Cyprus is the third largest island in the Mediterranean, and it can be split into approximately four geographical and corresponding geological zones, which are the Trodos Massif in the center of the Ophiolite complex here, uh, the Mamonia terrain, thank you, the Mamonia terrain in the west part of Cyprus, uh, the Masaria Valley, where uh, the two sites are located, uh, and the Chironia uh, terrain in the, in the north part of the island. Uh, in terms of the types of clays that you can source uh, on Cyprus, uh, they include mineral types such as Montbrillianite, Smectite, Bentonite, and of course there are small portions of Kalanite. 
More importantly, uh, there are two major rivers in Cyprus, the Pedios and the Yalyans. And so I, another part of the study will be to sample uh, clays from the river valleys, from the leading from the Trodos Mountains uh, down to as close as we can get to the buffer zone. Uh, to give you a brief background into the Late Bronze Age, this uh, research is situated uh, at the beginning of the Late Bronze Age and runs to around the Late Cypriot uh, 2B period. To explain uh, the chronology in Cyprus, like in the Aegean, it's uh, split into a tripartite scheme, which was developed by Einar Gerstad in the 1920s, uh, primarily based on ceramics. So the specific period that I will be studying is uh, Late Cypriot 1A, which is, corresponds to around 1675 BCE, to uh, 1340 BCA, the late Cypriot 2B period. Uh, with, um, with the late Bronze Age came many uh, major changes in society, not, include, not only including uh, settlement, practice, uh, settlement patterns, burial practices, uh, as well as ceramic uh, changes in ceramic technology. And in particular, I'll be focusing on what's called the late Cypriot 2A-B period, um, which is rather understudied and precedes some of the really material changes uh, in Cyprus. In particular, uh, the presence of Ashlar masonry, which starts to really appear at Ankhumi at the late Cypriot 2C period. In terms of ceramics, uh, some of the biggest changes on the island uh, include the production of new wares, such as uh, handmade wares like white slip and base ring, but it also uh, marks the introduction of the wheel to Cyprus, which uh, can be described as quite technologically abrupt uh, in the sense that uh, the wheel arrived on Cyprus as a what uh, Kuru and Napa called a fully formed package. Uh, unlike in Crete, where they were um, using the wheel from smaller to larger shapes over time, uh, when they arrived in Cyprus, they were producing all of the shapes and sizes on the wheel, uh, from very fine bichrome wheel made wear to uh, plain jugs uh, like red and black zip or, or plain white. And so in essence, the, one of the things I want to investigate is how, how this new technology affected uh, raw material selection, production, uh, at particular sites like Enkumi, where they're using uh, potentially sand-tempered fabrics, uh, we want to we want to understand why they were using this uh, using this temper. So the first case study is is, uh, is Enkumi, which is one of the most well-studied sites uh, in Cyprus, most well activated, uh, and it has a long history of research, which stretches back to illegal excavations in the 1870s uh, by Major Alessandro di Cesnola. Uh, but later on, there would be smaller studies by Smith, uh, funded by Miss Emma Turner. And then there would be uh, a major excavation by Anna Kersad in the 1920s, <clears throat> which admittedly they found that they did discover some settlement remains, uh, but they misinterpreted them as Byzantine. So it wouldn't be until the excavations by, of a joint uh, expedition by the French Archaeological Mission and the Cyprus government in the 1940s and 1950s by Porfirio Stichios and Claude Schaefer that they were able to uh, uncover the settlement of Ankumi of the Late Bronze Age. The pottery that I'll be studying uh, comes primarily from areas one and three of uh, Dikios' excavations. The second case study is called Ayos Zomenos, which is uh, about 20 kilometers from here in the Yalias River Valley. I should stress, first of all, that it's not actually one site, it's rather um, a collection of, a cluster of sites, I should say, uh, fortresses, as well as uh, smaller uh, inland valley uh, localities called Chipolos, Ambelia, and Tabrisis. Like Enkomi, it also has a long history of research, uh, which stretches back to the 1890s, uh, with the first excavations by Max Onafal Schrichter. Later, there will be a, a survey by Hector Catling uh, in the Yalias Valley and uh, all of Cyprus in general, and another one uh, specifically in the Iowa Solomon's Valley by Andre Abro. And in these two surveys, they started to understand that there was late Bronze Age sites uh, appearing uh, in this valley which were later confirmed by excavations of the Department of Antiquities uh, and Dr. Tosquina Pelides. Uh, at these uh, two localities, uh, Bambelia and Tripolis, they found agricultural storage as well as pottery production, which makes Ayos Zomenos uh, a very important inland site, and to stress, not on the coast. <laughs> Previous research uh, into fabrics from both sites is rather limited. Um, they tended to focus on the fine wares rather than the uh, plain or, or utilitarian pottery. Of the ones that are uh, that do include plain white wares or red and black slip, um, they tend to be small in number. So one of the main objectives is to establish the local production at Enkomi in order for us to understand um, what's important, what's not, what's not important, et cetera. 
This has more recently uh, been rectified by uh, a work with Lindy Crew, uh, who did a massive statistical study on the pottery from Ankomi, as well as organize it into uh, fabric groups. But before that, uh, just to give you a brief introduction to the wares, uh, there are four, okay, two main groups and two subgroups. So plain white, uh, handmade, well-made, uh, and red and black soot, uh, handmade, well-made. And they do actually correspond uh, pretty well to the fabric groups established by crew, which we can see here. So essentially uh, there are a couple, there are six, but in total we will probably, I'll be focusing on four. So red and black slip two, which is a typical handmade, red and black slip three, typical wheel made, and then same for plain white, typical handmade, typical wheel made. In terms of uh, manufacturing techniques, there has been also limited work uh, on studying of macroscopic traces on the island of Cyprus in the Bronze Age, with the exception of a few people such as uh, Jennifer Webb at uh, Marquis Alonia, uh, crew at Enkumi, uh, as well as Caroline Jeffer at Enkumi, and uh, Artemis Oryu in the later Bronze Age, early Iron Age uh, part of the chronology. So it'll be uh, a focus of mine to, to study these macroscopic traces uh, and to understand uh, what kind of techniques they were using on the wheel, whether it was by coiling and wheel making or slab and wheel making, these sort of things. In terms of my methodology, I'm going to be uh, using a number of techniques, uh, including macroscopic analysis, of which is around 80% done, uh, ceramic petrography, as well as uh, handheld XRF as kind of a pre-screening uh, uh, technique to understand large fabric groups before we go into more detailed analysis, which, it, uh, which includes scanning electron microscopy, uh, geological sampling with the help of a, a geologist from Cyprus, Dr. Zomenez and me, experimental archaeology, and lastly, uh, ICPMS, which will be done in Lubin later on. I want to focus a bit on experimental archaeology because it's something that uh, I have some background in. Uh, essentially, there are two types of experiments that I'm going to try to to run. Uh, the first one will be uh, a laboratory experiment, uh, which if you can see in the top right corner, uh, you can uh, you can see it's a firing experiment in the sense that you, you fire the clay at various temperatures in order to understand, uh, to compare to the archaeological material. So you, so you can see the firing temperature and of course you need an SEM to help you with that. The second one is more actualistic experiments, which are based on uh, trying to replicate using archaeological accurate materials, the techniques, the processes, and the artifacts from, from the late Bronze Age. And I am a potter for the last couple of years, so I will hopefully be employing that in my, in my research. In terms of the expected outcomes, like I said, the main, the main point is to establish the local profile of Enkumi uh, in order to make sure we can understand what's local and what's not local because to date there hasn't been any exhaustive study on fabrics from from Enkumi, uh, besides a few studies that focus on the more fine wares and also uh, to look at the technological uh, data so what types of uh, clay were they using or how far were they going to, to sample now while I do want to try and answer some questions about where they were sampling our clay it's not the main focus um, the geological samples will, use, will be used more as analogy than to actually provenance specific areas uh, of Cyprus. And of course, I want to look at uh, the, the potter's wheel and how it was used uh, in, in Cyprus and to what extent um, it affected raw material selection and, and production. Thank you for attention. Thank you, Chase. Um, our next speaker is uh, Timothy Ogao. Timothy, please. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for having me here and allowing me to present my guest topic. So today I'm going to um, talk about uh, a holistic approach to the study of cooking ware from Tumba Salonikis from the late Bronze Age to the early Iron Age. So the site of Tumba is located in northern Greece, uh, in central Macedonia, uh, next to the Thermaikol Gulf, 
This one uh, is a site which has attracted the interest of archaeologists in the end of the 19th century and has been studied since then, although discontinuously. Currently, the site has been excavated since uh, 1984 under the supervision of the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. It is one of the biggest sites uh, in uh, central Macedonia. It's, it's a tell site, a tell mound, covering an area of around one hectare. And uh, the ellipsoidal mound rise above 20 meters and is only 1.5 kilometers uh, away from the sea today. The site is nowadays embedded in the modern city and the two ancient streams which used to run along its sides are now long gone and covered by streets. Um, it was continuously occupied from the Middle Bronze Age to the Edenic period, so an, uh, a period of around 1,500 years, uh, with some later present reoccupation. This long occupation created the mound itself, which was densely inhabited with complexes of multiple rooms separated by narrow streets, at least during its later um, phases. The mound was also encircled by surrounding walls and terraces, and this architectural organization was kept by the inhabitants who reconstructed them repeatedly over time during the late Bronze Age. Uh, my PhD um, topic aims to a direct study of the cooking ware of Tumba Salonikis through an interdisciplinary and holistic approach by combining a typological, technological, and functional approach of the ceramic assemblages. I will tackle uh, several questions. Um, so what was the repertoire of the Bacchic cuisine? What were the ceramic traditions? How were the vessel manufacturers with what type of um, techniques and what type of clay? What were the provenance of the vessels? Were they made locally or imported? Um, where, um, what were the cooking practices? So how did uh, people of, ancient, uh, of these ancient communities um, cooked? And of course, I will look at all of this question uh, through um, a diachronic uh, perspective. Um, the ultimate objective would be to discuss such data in the context of the intense mobility interactions attested in the region with other Asian and Balkan communities during the so-called Mycenaean period um, to the time of the first Greek colonies, resulting in significant social, cultural, and economic transformation. Um, I will um, use four different approaches uh, to name them typology, function, um, technology, and uh, experimentation, uh, which would be combined to reconstruct the various stages of the life of the object from its conception to its use to its final discard. These uh, four approaches combined together will allow interpretation of the variability of the chain of Artois and in the cooking practices. Sorry. The relevant evidence. Uh, is being collected through a detailed macroscopic study uh, combined with a number of scientific methods. So petrography analysis with infection, element analysis with WDXRF, uh, X-ray radiography for the technological part, and for the functional aspects, I will use uh, also some protein and lipid analysis. Uh, today, I will put uh, emphasis though on the technological aspect. Um, of course, all those information, observations are recorded on a purpose-built database, and each approach has its own table. Technical drawings are also being made, and uh, the technological and functional traces are documented on them. Three buildings, uh, Alpha, uh, Vita, and Epsilon, have been selected and um, dates to the latest phase, uh, phases of the late Bronze Age. Uh, the aim here is to compare the cooking vessel within and between buildings in the course of two to three centuries. So far, um, I have um, processed. Um, 1,600 shirts from building B and E uh, on a very basic recording um, from context with cooking activities. And I have taken out 600 pots uh, to do some uh, further study and analysis. Similarly, I have also recorded uh, 245 pots uh, in detail, uh, mainly from building A, uh, but also from other contexts, uh, I mean, from period ranging from the Middle Bronze Age to uh, the proto german period. Samples have been selected based on typology, chain of artois, and uses evidence from different spaces in order to have a representative picture of the archaeological assemblages. So far, uh, the typological classification includes a variety of shapes of vessel forms, and there is a, a significant sorry, variations of the size, as you can see on the slide. Uh, here, all the drawings are, are at the same scale. So we have some large, medium, and um, much smaller vessels. Some with decoration, so impression, incision, and plastic decorations. Um, the main shapes are um, the pithway cooking jar, wide mouth with coated body. We also have some jugs and cups. 
And we also do have some uh, particular shapes like uh, the piravnos, uh, piravni, which are uh, kind of cooking pots with a stand, which is um, attested in Balkans and uh, in Northern Greece, but also tapsia, which are the types of plates um, uh, made uh, with uh, fabric with inorganic and organic temper, and which is fired at a low temperature, but also some double cups with handles. <clears throat> Following the French anthropological approach and methodology of the Chanel Paratoire developed notably by Bantin Roux, uh, the marker traces are observed in order to reconstruct the methods used to fashion the cooking pots, um, meaning uh, an order sequence of functional op operations carried out by sets of sedimentary gestures for which different techniques can be used. And a sequence is comprises uh, of phases and stages. So the phases um, defines the three parts of uh, the vessel, so the body, uh, sorry, the bay, the body, and the opening, and the two stages, um, the roughing out and the preforming. To recall the macrotrices, we're reading the grid established by Van uh, The variables are the following, um, the relief, the type of fracture, the surface, the decorative traits, the radial section, and the harness. Until now, observations have shown a low viability of the channel paratoire, um, which is uh, not surprising because we're only dealing with one type of ceramic cooking pots. And thus, uh, we are not um, taking into account um, tableware or storage vessel, for example, which um, limits, of course, the possibility to have a wider functional variation of the Chenin Paratoire. The only roughing out technique um, which is attested is the coiling technique, um, mainly uh, pinch coils, which are placed at the bevel, so inside, outside, so PAP for short. Uh, which consists of placing the coils uh, on the edge of the previous one. And this uh, type of coiling is characterized by a low deformation of the coils. Um, but sometimes the modality of placing could not be identified when the coils were too thick, but in general, coils are um, around 1.4 uh, centimeters in diameter. The performing shows a bigger variation. We mainly have scraping uh, and continuous pressure. Stripping is used for all the parts of the body, even though it is rarely attested for the rim. Um, and the rim and the edges of the base of the sand of the pilagnos uh, are performed by continuous pressure in general. Uh, in some rare cases, in specific shape, we do have some beating and wheel coiling for the performing, uh, but only in, in few vessels. Um, the former, the beating, seems to be a local tradition while the latter, the wheel coiling technique seems to be uh, from imports and uh, the fabric doesn't match uh, with the local clay sources. And since there is no evidence of um, trial and error of um, this uh, kind of technique of wheel mail um, technique with cooking pots during the late bronze age in Kumba. The vessels are then smoothed either on wet paste or leather hard and with, or, I mean, with a dry or a wet tool. And they may also have a suitable treatment either um, an ungob, a burnishing, a passive decoration, uh, impressions, and or uh, incisions. Uh, the main variation um, thus are the fashioning of the base and the finishing uh, and the super treatments. Here you can see uh, the different types of base that uh, there is, I mean, that I have seen so far in Tumba. Um, so we have simple disc by calling and spiral. Um, so simple disc by calling, um, but also double disc by calling, uh, maybe in spiral again, um, which are more uh, related to this kind of um, disc shaped base. We might have some um, base body um, fashion on a convex mold with uh, coiling again, but I'm not sure. I have to, to check this. And we do have some uh, wheel coiling base. Um, uh, for the fabric, then, um, Evangelia Kidazi, during her PhD on ceramic technology of Tumba, Sonikis, in 2000, identified four macro, uh, ma four macro uh, fabric groups. Sorry, uh, Three of them are uh, documented here through petrographic analysis. Uh, all of them are compatible with the local geology, uh, but are part of different sources in different parts of the sites. So here, the fabric he one is uh, mainly composed of highly altered basic igneous rock. We have quartz, and people, white mica, epidotes, feldspar, biotites, and also some intra basic rocks, which are altered, and which are the main component of the second fabric, he two, uh, where we have um, quartz, schist, phyllites, mica, biotites, and also some altered basic igneous rocks, which is 
the main components of uh, the public key one. Then a uh, public key four is much more um, poetic, much more sandy. Um, we have mainly quartz, mono and polycrystalline, some feldspar, which is a metamorphic rock. So um, quartz, feldspar, mica and schist, some micas, either white or biotite, some epidote group minerals and some antibol. Um, for the functional aspect, um, there is a lack of methodology in general in the functional study of pottery and also lack of common terminology. People refer to the same apotrosis but with different names, which creates a confusion. Um, however, it is an aspect that um, is gaining more and more interest nowadays, and archaeologists are currently trying to connect um, use where evidences, uh, use where evidence um, with specific activities, specific gestures, and um, here in my case, culinary habits. Uh, the analysis um, of, of use word traces is essential to identify the actual function of the vessels, as technomorphal functional studies have shown that the intended function of a vessel is not always respected um, during its use, or that the function of an object can change over time, or it can have multiple uh, functions, and so on. Therefore, to understand the function of a base, uh, one needs to look at the morphology in, a, in order to understand um, the different um, uh, performance uh, characteristics, so the, the stability, the trans trans transportability, the accessibility, the capacity and hitting effectiveness of the pot, um, but also take into account the use for evidence to understand what it was I and mean, what the pot was used for and what it was used with. Um, Ethnoarchological study and experimentation have shown that the pattern of soot and carbonization seems to be indicative of the type of uh, cooking and so the mode of cooking. So here, for example, the main types, um, I mean, in general, in archaeology that we can uh, find um, are frying, boiling, and roasting. And the mode, I mean, based on the, on the use where evidence, we might be able to say uh, if it's the pot was placed in fire next to the fire on poles. And of course, um, those traces can be um, made through um, different origins, so mechanical origin, chemical, or thermal uh, sources. Here I have um, put some examples um, of what I have. Um, so for example, I have white scaling, so calcareous deposits probably on the inside uh, surface of uh, some vessels. I also have uh, in some rare cases, uh, black um, remains uh, of black incrustation uh, at the bottom of some bases. Uh, and also, as you can see in the small cup, um, suit and composition pattern uh, opposed to the handle. So there seems to be a variety of shapes, and this may be different functions uh, at Tumba. The cooking pots uh, with particular shapes may have also been used for specific activities. A long lasting tradition of certain type of shapes um, are attested since the Middle Bronze Age and the Late Bronze Age and even photogeometric period. That is the case, for example, for the tapsia, the plates. A low variety of the shell laboratoire uh, is attested, but also with some variation. The wheel calling technique seems to be um, to reflect importation as it doesn't appear to be compatible with the local ceramic traditions, but further analysis needs to be done. Uh, more recording is indeed uh, is necessitated uh, to, um, to get a better grasp of the cooking assemblages of Intumba. And finally, um, a holistic approach is necessary to look at the ceramic, not only at the medium for one specific event of its life, but to look at the entirety of the biography of the object. Um, starting by the way it was manufactured to the end project and the way it was used. And this will eventually enable us to get a better understanding of the intricate relationship between technology, morphology, and functions. Uh, I would like to thank the efforts of Antibody of Sassaniki, but also the team of Tumba, the Fitch Lab, and uh, my uh, lab uh, in my French university in Paris, Ascan, for the help and their support. And thank you. Our next speaker is Christiana Kelepeshi. Christiana, please. Okay, hello everyone. So today I'm presenting you uh, the preliminary results of my ongoing PhD research, which focuses on the analytical examination of tablewares from the side of Saralasus. Uh, in this presentation, I'll focus on the petrographic and geochemical data for uh, around 100 samples, 
But before proceeding on with the data, let me first say a few words about the site and uh, uh, also the samples that are included in the study. The site of Sahalassos, which is located in modern day Southwest Turkey, has been extensively excavated by Kaidu Levent University since the uh, 1980s. And exactly for that reason, uh, we have a lot of evidence for the ceramic production happening at the time. During the Hellenistic period, uh, the evidence is rather limited. Clean remains have been discovered uh, underneath the Roman Eteon and are associated with ceramics dating to the end of the third and the first half of the second century BC. The evidence of ceramic production at that location is also confirmed by geophysical surveys, which revealed the presence of clean remains in that area. During the later first century BC, Sahalassos became the main ceramic production center in the region with the production of a type of red slip tableware, the so-called Sahalassos red slipware. This ware was produced at Tagalassos, and the workshops, workshops associated with this production have been uh, excavated to the eastern parts of the ancient city. Based on the uh, available evidence, these workshops were active until the second half of the, second, of the 6th century AD, but Tagalassos Red Ware continues to be produced even till the end of the 7th century. So there is a big question where the production was taking place during that later phase. And it's one of the questions that we have in this project. So uh, in more detail, uh, our uh, aims are at two levels. Firstly, at an intra-regional level, uh, the aim is to reconstruct the pottery tradition and craft technology in the long Pure by addressing questions related to the technology of production the provenance of raw materials and the organization of production. For instance, uh, we are uh, trying to understand how uh, the Sagalassos Red Slipware emerged and how does it relate to the pre existing tradition of slip for the re Hellenistic period. And also uh, try to see if there is any change in terms of the use of raw materials over time and in terms of the organization of production. And secondly, at an inter-regional level, we're trying to uh, employ the concept of ceramic koini in order to understand how the tableware ceramic repertoire that we see at Sagalassos fits with the wider picture of tableware production in Southwest Asia Mine. And to answer these questions, uh, the project includes samples dating to different chronological phases of the site's occupational history. For the Hellenistic period, the main tablewares that are uh, present at the site uh, belong to the category of the color-coded wares and also to the Hellenistic gray wares with black sleeve. From the early imperial uh, period onwards until the end of the early Byzantine period, the main tableware that we see is the Sahalassos red slipware that was locally produced. Uh, but we also included some imported sigillata, Eastern Sigillata samples in order to uh, compare them with the local production. And from the end of the early Byzantine period and the early medieval period, we see that there are uh, new wares, uh, new uh, wares that start appearing, and we included them in this study as well. In this presentation, I will focus on uh, 100 samples that are coming from different uh, periods and belong to different wares. And all the samples have been examined using thin section ceramic petrography and have been chemically characterized using ICPOES and ICPMS analysis. The chemical data have been processed statistically using our software, and we employed a hierarchical cluster analysis and principal component analysis. So in this presentation, we'll look at the results of the statistical analysis in correlation with the petrographic and typological data. A hierarchical cluster analysis was applied as a technique to identify groups in the data set. And the results are presented as a datagram uh, with the samples uh, being presented based on their similarity. What we can see is that there are uh, two main clusters in the data set. But when we look in more uh, detail and when we compare the results of the petrography and the typological study, we see that the best number of cluster is actually eight. When we employed uh, the principal component analysis, 
uh, we could explain uh, the variability uh, of around 67.27%. And then we compared the results of the PCA with the cluster suggested by hierarchical cluster analysis. So let us now have a closer look in each cluster separately. The majority of the samples uh, belong to cluster one, which is separated by the high magnesium oxide and cobalt, co co cobalt co uh, nickel and the chromium contents, as you can see on the PCA plot. And the samples of this cluster uh, belong to two main fabrics. Fabric one is a fine grain fabric uh, with quartz and limestone. And fabric B uh, is a much more uh, levigated fabric, as you can see, with very few inclusions of quartz and muscovite mica. Typologically, uh, the samples belong to the gray wares with black slip, the color coated wares, and the Sagalasso's red slip wear. Cluster two uh, appears to the right side of the PCA plot and is separated because of the high calcium uh, oxide values. And um, this is explained also petrographically uh, because uh, the samples belong to uh, very calcareous fabrics. Fabric C is a fine grain fabric with serpentinized inclusions and pores, which can explain also the high magnesium oxide content. And fabric D, which is a medium fine grain fabric, very calcareous with large uh, pyroxene inclusions. Uh, the samples typologically uh, belong to the Eastern Sigillat IA, uh, which is related to Fabric C. And Fabric D includes uh, samples of this transitional period of early Byzantine and early medieval uh, silt tablewares. Cluster uh, 3 uh, is separated uh, also because of the high calcium oxide content, but it also has lower strontium and uh, higher barium content compared to Cluster 2. Typologically, uh, petrographically, sorry, the samples uh, belong to different fabrics, uh, but they are all characterized by the predominance of sedimentary rocks, uh, such as limestone and chert, and they also have uh, include some fossils, which can explain, of course, the high calcium oxide, oxide content. Uh, other, uh, other fabrics of this group, like Fabric A, include also some uh, volcanic rock fragments, apart from limestone, which can explain the high barium content. Typologically, uh, the samples belong to the Hayes, the color coded wares, the first phase of Sagalasso's red slipwear, and some of the later Byzantine and Arabic medieval table wares. Cluster four is a, a very close cluster in the PCA plot and is characterized by the uh, enriching, is enriching is strontium and rare earth elements. As you can see, it's located to the left side of the PCA plot. Petrographically, uh, the samples are uh, characterized by a fine grain fabric with quartz, limestone, and uh, clay pellets, and they belong to the early phase of Sahalasa's red silkware. Cluster 5 appear, appears as extreme in the PCA plot with very low calcium oxide content, high alumina and silica oxide values, and high rare elements. At the moment, this cluster is, it just includes two samples, so it's very difficult to say a bit more about that. But we hope that we will uh, incorporate the analysis of uh, more samples, it will appear more clear. Uh, it is uh, Petrographically, it is related to uh, more coarser fabrics with volcanic uh, rock fragments and a lot of minerals that are associated with igneous uh, geology. And uh, that's why uh, it appears very high in rare earth elements. And typologically, uh, they are related to tablewares of, of this transitional period of early Byzantine and early medieval wares. And one sample belongs to the pattern range wares. Cluster six appears rather scattered around in the PCA plot, uh, but is, um, is separated from the rest of the sample because of the higher aluminum oxide values and uh, higher area filaments. Petrographically, uh, they are all uh, loners and they are all related to uh, probably imported wares uh, belonging to the Hellenistic gray wares with black silk, west slope wear, and black loose wear. 
And uh, they have inclusions, some of the fabrics have inclusions related to metamorphic, uh, metamorphic geology, which we do not uh, find in the uh, geology of Samalasus. Cluster 7 appears to the higher, uh, higher part of the PCA growth because of the higher strontium and uh, calcium oxide values. And this is uh, a very uh, uh, homogeneous cluster because they all belong to, to a fabric with uh, limestone shells and sandstone, which explains the high calcium and strontium values. And they are all dated to the uh, early Byzantine period, and they belong to this new uh, safe table where that we see uh, in this period. And uh, one another big cluster that we see in the assemblage is cluster eight, which is characterized by higher rare elements and lower magnesium oxide values. And uh, petrographically, it's again uh, a bit, uh, there is a lot of variability. But all the samples have a lot of volcanic uh, rock fragments, which again explains that they uh, they plot to the left side of the of the BCA uh, by plot with the higher earth elements. And typologically, they are dated to the later period to the early Byzantine and early medieval tablewares. So how can we explain all this data? Uh, first of all. Uh, we can see that there is a continuous exploitation of uh, the same clay source for the Hellenistic slip tablewares and for the Sahalasos red slipware later on, uh, which is the cluster one and the main fabrics, fabric A and B. Uh, but based on the petrographic results, we see that there is a difference in the processing of raw materials and also in the firing conditions. For example, when we have the Hellenistic greywares with black slip, we see that they are fired under reducing conditions. And also we see that from early imperial onwards, early imperial period onwards, there is much more uh, levigation of the clay uh, and it appears much more clean with less inclusions. There is also evidence of uh, local production for the gray wares with black slip, which cluster together with the Sahalasos red slipware. And this is the first time that we, uh, we, uh, we investigate analytically this type of wear from the, from the side of Salasus. And there is also at the same time evidence for the uh, existence of multiple production centers in the wider region of Asia Minor uh, for gray wares with black slip, which was something that has been hypothesized by Hayes when he was uh, first uh, studying and, uh, uh, and uh, naming this, uh, this wear. We also see that there is, while they were using the, uh, the clay source uh, for the Sagalasos Red Slipware during the first phase, the first phase that plots in the cluster one, we see that there are also other clay sources that were exploded and which are more related to an ophiolitic geology. Uh, and finally, we see that during the end of the early Byzantine and the beginning of uh, early medieval period, there is a much higher uh, fabric and chemical variability which we still need to uh, interpret uh, with incorporating uh, results from more samples. And in, in terms of the future work, uh, we are going to compare the data with uh, the geochemical data for the clay sources of the region, which have been extensively uh, characterized in the past. And uh, we will uh, compare, as I've said already, with the data for the rest of the samples. And finally, we will analyze uh, the slip using uh, SEM ETS, and hopefully we will be able to draw more conclusions and understand better the ceramic production in the long term. Thank you. Thank you, Christiana. I would like to invite our final uh, speaker uh, for this session, uh, Theodore uh, Basile. Hello, everyone. So this presentation uh, is working. It's working great. So this presentation aims to offer some preliminary results on a case study focusing on the early medieval cooking pot from Cyprus. This project is part of my ongoing PhD research on early medieval ceramics in the Eastern Mediterranean, 
Here are the University of Cyprus under the supervision of Professor Leonis and funded by EU in the framework of Place Network. So at the beginning of the 7th century, the island was a prosperous province of the East Roman Empire surrounded by a Byzantine sea with bustling cities and the busy countryside. Uh, late antique found Cyprus as an integral part of regional and long distance trade among Byzantine provinces and beyond, something seen in both literary resources and material culture, evidently important funds. Soon, though, this picture changed first by the challenges of the Persian Empire against the Romans, and eventually in the mid 7th century with the Supreme Court of Islam that changed the geopolitical map of that time. Traditionally, the Arab invasions of the mid-7th marked the division between the late antique and the early Middle Ages in Cyprus. Naturally, those violent events had an impact on every aspect of life in the islands, such as administration, trade, economy, the social fabric of the society. Pottery wise, all these changes reflect in a sheer decline in imports of fine tableware, the well known slipwares, and the industrial scale production of ceramics in general stripping us from a well-recognized ceramic typology and resulting in a hard to recognize but definitely present assemblage of non-diagnostic common grades. Recent studies though have proposed a new typology for this period and that despite the picture of destruction and decline shows signs of ceramic um, continuity and resilience including our primary focus for today, King Pots. Through the use of ceramic petrography, this case study aspires to contribute to the ongoing research of this period by investigating um, the composition and possibly technological aspects of early medieval wares found in Cyprus. For this case study, early medieval material from four late Roman churches uh, was chosen from the southeastern slopes of Prodos, the late Roman village um, of Calapasos Popetra, and the Panagia church of the Agritan of Confiru, located at the Basilicos and Ceros Valley, respectively. At the Akrotiri Peninsula, the Church of Catalina of Placoton, and at the West, the Basilica of Gerskipu at the Aigi Pende locality, close to the city of Paphos. Starting from the impressive, as you can see, Church of Catalina of Placoton, cooking pots associated with the post destruction phases of Building A were collected and dated to the mid 7th century associated with the Arab attacks. Specifically, the pots were found in a room belonging to the south ancillary building of the complex into the southwestern. Uh, corner of the south transit arm and its neighborhood pole. You can see them there. They represent a typical Diorio type cooking pot with the upright convex rim and strap handles. You can see an example from uh, the famous Cormac Gate right there. Continuing with the site of IG Pente, excavated by Professor Dimitri Pelidis, the Lavis Pita Basilica offered both wheel thrown and handmade open and closed forms of different cooking vessel types. At the late Roman site of Calapasos Popetra, four locations, two churches, one monastic complex, and two residential areas provided us with examples of wheel throne, cooking pots. Here you can see them divided by Professor Rotman in microscopic groups and vessels of the handmade tradition. Last, at Cuthinu, rescue excavations of the Department of Antiquities at the 11th century church revealed an earlier phase of the late 6th or 7th century three island basilica partially destroyed due to an earthquake, according to the excavator, in the mid 7th century. During the investigation of the Mikro Byzantine Buildings floor, more examples of early medieval handmade and wood thrown pots were recovered. The petrographic analysis of all 75 samples resulted in the formation of the following petroglyphs per site. I want to stress that the presentation of the fabrics is going to be very, very brief, considering the given time constraints. At Akrotiri, three different fabrics were reported. One sample showed a poorly sorted local surface fabric with kidney rock fragments, limestone like quartz and metal quartz grains, alkali feldspar, pleasure plates, and parts of the Muscovite mica. The samples following the typical Diorius cooking pot, you can see them here and here, offered two distinctly separate fabrics, one dark homogeneous fabric of what appears to be natural mixed deposit of the shoulders of your lights with some sedimentary additions and is characterized by the presence of matrix fragments, and pyroxenes, altered um, serpentines, mainly pleasure place, feldspars, chairs, and quartz. Inter interestingly, the other fabric, which includes the majority of the sites, the audio site samples, could be characterized as heterogeneous due to the presence of plastic inclusions to play and you cannot see them really. Here because it's a bit dark, with a bimodal grain size distribution of quartz and church grains. The picture at the side of your skipu appears to be a bit more complicated, following the complex geology of the west part of Cyprus. Four main fabrics were recorded with built-on vessels found in this fabric here and 
these vessels right here, GAPA and GAPC. GAPA, probably coming from secondary clay deposit, shows a red matrix with a common presence of large mafic um, rock fragments, dirt, limestone fragments, feldspars, quartz, and marine microfossils. In GAPC, the mafic rock inclusions appear much larger, showing a bimodality in inclusion size distribution. It is interesting, though, that, the, that for the production of handmade vessels and those made with a low rotational kinetic energy, maybe through the use of a rotary device, a matte stone, stone siltstone tempered fabric was used. One variation you can see right here. It appears in a, in a bright red fabric with a dominant presence of very large red matte stones in cases longer than two millimeters in the long axis, volcanic rocks and frost structure. Fine grains of uh, quartz and other silicates comprise the fine fraction, and similar fabrics, I want to say here that similar fabrics have also recorded in cooking pots coming from the same area, but in late Bronze Age um, context. So this line presents the loner fabrics of those people, but I want you to see this one right here. We can see again the sand tempered quartz and shirt dark red fabric that appears here. Uh, this sign showing larger equipment and elongated algebra angular grains in the coarse fraction. At Calabasas Copetra, most of the thin wall cooking pots appear to be in a similar sand-tempered fabric here and here, as discussed in the last two signs. For the production of the handmade cooking pots, a very coarse fabric was used with high isotropic matrix hosting very large matrix inclusions, pledge of case kind of paroxysm and amphiboles, and generally inclusions common in the trough of the sophiolite. Not only there is a striking Similarity in composition with test briquettes coming from soil sampling around the area of Calabasas, courtesy of Dr. Maria de Comitu. But also, a very similar fabric was recorded, I think it's a very similar fabric, recorded in Calabasas, I guess, Dimitrios Pila and Pila, for, again for late Bronze Age cooking pots. The thickly potted casseroles formed with a low rotation of kinetic energy, again, with the use of um, the turntable, the slow turntable. Consistently show one coarse fabric with slight variance in it. It is mainly characterized by a relatively homogeneous reddish brown color matrix, and again, frequently presence of matrix rocks, um, poly and monocrystalline rust grains, kind of paraxine, amphibole grains, and things that we already see in the troposphere of the trophosphere light. Here, too, the outliers provide us with another example here of the Viorius cooking pots with igneous inclusions as the one seen at the Catenimata of Makoton. At the site of Pamelia Cofinu, a probably naturally mixed deposit of alluvial origin, this one right here, appears to have been used for the production of thickly potted casseroles and cooking pots made probably not on the, on the fast, on the fast rotating potter wheel. A poorly sorted calcareous and stroke matrix rich in planktonic and planktonic foraminifera shows a common presence of mafic rock inclusions, people kind of party, uh, grains and fewer cases uh, of For the same time, a second non calcareous fabric associated with the trophosophilus again, but with a, they show actually a really uh, optically inactive matrix, maybe implying prolonged firing temperatures and higher temperatures. This fabric shows a similar composition with fabric KKC that we saw at Calabasas used for the same type of vessels. Finally, the largest number of samples of wheel thrown cooking pots found in post mid 7th century context show again this homogeneous dark red fabric of almost or completely isotropic matrices with the dominant presence of coarse grains. So, what do we get of all this? As you can see, well, Chase show again this, uh, this map, geological map of Cyprus. The Trovo's massive, located approximately at the center of the island. You can see the gap row with, uh, with the green color, I believe, in the south. And the, um, the diabetes and the lot of those with the pinkish and purple color, like uh, which is actually the, the origin of the mafic. As long as the hand made vessels and those made with the use of this low rotating device is concerned, here we can see the distribution known so far. This is not a complete map, but just to give, you, to give you an idea of the early seventh to post mid seventh century context. Here we see again the local clays used for those pots, mostly red clays with plutonic and subvolcanic rocks found around the Trogo Mountains, and in the case of Euroskipu, matte stone tempered red clays. 
it seems that on the south, southeastern slope of Trogos, an idea that already has been expressed, multiple local workshops exploded the red clays of the mountain already from the early 7th century for the production of pots following the handmade and the slow forming tradition. This fabric variability supports the idea, as I told before, of a common ceramic tradition practice in multiple local workshops supplying local markets or in household production, perhaps uh, covering their own needs. In the case of Panagia Cofinu, we can safely claim that the fabric PKOB, the one with um, that showed higher um, temperatures, was used for the production of casseroles. That was used for the production of casseroles appears in even later shapes, as observed by the speaker, dated well in the 12th century onward, showing the, the continuation of the exploitation of those deposits, a practice which survived the early Middle Ages into the Middle Byzantine period. Lastly, we could not but address the fabric found in typical Dioria spots, and especially the globular cooking pot with the upright convex rim. So far, the mid seven uh, works of Dioria's offered the reference and proof of the local production of those pots. That we can find them all over again, and from the late sixth century onwards. Before. The geography showed two main fabric groups, one represented by a small number of samples but reflecting a possible secret origin, and the Napa, which includes a vast majority of samples falling into this site, having a sand tempered fabric and found in every site. The, um, the abundance of quartz and at the same time the lack of any other diagnostic material that could be associated with the geology of Cyprus drives us to seek an origin elsewhere. Some previous studies have already raised this issue, for instance, at the site of Salanda Colonis, John Hayes mentions the possible foreign origin of those examples coming from the mid-70s deposits. And Marcus Rotman at Calcutta points to the Levant for the, for the production of these thin wall cooking pots. In a West Mediterranean context, um, Jonah Baxman, uh, for example, challenged the secret origin of the Dioria's pot and pointed to the production of these pots in Beirut. One or so in Beirut. In later periods on Cyprus, we again we recall this fabric, but uh, and linked to the Levant to the Levantine coast, um, found in medieval, in medieval contexts. Similar hard fire red fabrics of brittle or gritty texture following the same type are found in the coast of Cilicia, all over the coast of the Levant, where waste have also been found, and Egypt. So if we agree on the foreign origins of those vessels in Cyprus, one can notice the continuous presence of those imports through the 7th century, possibly to the 8th, probably showing a continuity from late antique to medieval times. For a more complete picture though, on the scale of production and distribution of Cypriot origin, the orange cooking pots, more analysis have to be undertaken. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. I would like to, to open the floor for questions now. And uh, I suggest we start uh, with the first speaker. Sara, are you here with us? Hello. Does anyone have a question for Sara? Yes, please. Yes, please. Thank you, Sara, for the very... Hi. <laughs> Um, basically, I wanted to ask if you mm -hmm. have any uh, direct evidence from kilns or wasters from this size, or the source certification will be based only from uh, the geology of the raw materials. Yeah, it will only be, be based on geology. We were we're organizing like um, raw material and clay sampling for next spring. But unfortunately, we don't have any like direct evidence of kilns or pottery production on those sites. And you have a heterogeneous geology, I assume, right? Yes, yes. And but so far, like the um, petrographic data, I mean, I've just finished, so, but it seems to, uh, to be local, at least all, almost all the samples seem to be local, of local origin. And one last question. Um, mm -hmm. Your macroscopic examination includes only the macrofabric analysis or you're planning to do? No, I have the uh, macro traces as well and everything. It's just for the presentation, I really have to keep it short. <laughs> so, Thank you very much. No worries. Any other questions? Yes, please, Mario. 
Hi, Maria. A question about your two main fabrics, if I remember them correctly, was one yes. quartz tempered and one shale tempered. Yes. Were there any patterns in terms of shapes or wares or any the, Unfortunately, that? like one of the main issues with my samples is that um, I don't have like a wear classification system. So, and also like even for one of the sites, the um, the early Iron Age one, I don't have I, any typological data neither. Like they are all body shirts, which is kind of like a main feature of many of those sites in this region that we only have like body body shirts, so, so we don't have typological data to look at. Um, yeah, but like. It's very recent, like literally yesterday I was taking the um, photo micrograph, so I don't have like, um, I haven't really been looking at them like deeply. Um, I have a question if I may. Um, you showed us the evidence about uh, two different uh, traditions of tempering. Um, yes. And um, I'm just wondering how your data fit in the broader context um, uh, from surrounding sites, because it's quite interesting to, set, to have this um, um, long-term um, uh, production of tempered pottery, two different types. Yes, well, this is another issue. Like, um, the, I don't have many um, archeometric data to compare with in the same region. I have data from Israel. Because like at least with archaeometallurgical studies, there have been like um, um, the connection with, uh, for instance, the Beersheba Valley in Israel, it's been like attested. So we will try to see what, because like um, we think, and this is one of our hypotheses, that some samples may be, may, may be imports from Israel. So we will try to look at that. But from the same region, like I only have like, one archaeometric study that's very recent, but from the Neolithic period. So we will try to see like whether like the petrographic and geochemical data it matches, and we will try to see whether like pottery, um, the ceramic technologies and uh, composition kind of um, is the same over time, or whether we can see any difference. We will try to compare that as much as we can, but we don't have too, ma uh, too much data to be honest. Thank you. Any other questions? No. Um, thank you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. uh, Chase, if you can come here, please. Um, any question for, uh, questions for Chase about his presentation? There's one. Ah, there is more. Sorry. Sorry for Sarah. Ah, for Chase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, uh, for who? No, no. It's, <laughs> Sorry. Chase, sorry, sorry. Ah, sorry, it's okay. Uh, Chase, you can... Should I read the question? Yes, please. <laughs> uh, Vasiliki is asking, um, what about the studies of Dimitris Ioannidis on metallurgical ceramics from Enkomi? Would it not be interesting to compare with your work, especially on cooking pots, etc.? Um, as far as far as I know, uh, the work of Ioannidis is mostly focused on technical ceramics, and I think he also focused on the copper and iron contents, not as much about compositional analysis. Uh, as for the cooking pots, I won't be doing any cooking pots, so <laughs> I'm not sure how relevant it would be to plain white or, or red and black slip, but I don't know, I'll have to look again. <laughs> Um, Jess, I was wondering why uh, these two sites? Uh, first of all, Enkomi was chosen because uh, it's one of the most well-known sites on the island. Um, it's one of the most well excavated, has very secure contexts, uh, so that's a big reason. Uh, and everybody knows Enkomi from the Bronze Age. And as for Ios Azomenos, um, it was more of uh, we needed a second site and some, some people had offered to be in a, and we had asked her basically. Uh, so, yeah, and it's it, it basically one of the main pro aspects of the project is to look at region, uh, regionalism in Cyprus. So mm -hmm. it's nice to have a second site within uh, within the island, but not, not close, as yeah. close to it. And do you expect to um, find uh, the local production on Agios uh, Sosomenos or? Uh, we will see. Um, 
we'll probably hopefully take around 200 samples from me in order to really look down at what's going on there. But uh, I also want to be more of a case study to see if we can actually compare the two and uh, if it has any similarities. Okay. That's it. Thank you, Thank you Chase. Um, our next speaker, Timothy, if you can come here, please, to take the questions. Anyone would like to start? Yes, please, Maria. Thank you. Uh, my question really relates to the other I asked Sarah also. You mentioned three different photographic patterns uh, that were, I'm going to say, from your left hand, there were three, three. Yeah, actually, there are four, but I only showed three of them. Okay, yeah. so my question is did you, where you, I know that you have seen them in very good early stage of this, so maybe I'm rushing that. Whether were you able to identify any patterns in relation to these specific fabrics or specific uh, shapes or morphological attributes or functional? Um. Okay, so uh, Maria de Cometo asked a question about if I see, I, I saw any pattern between the fabric uh, and the relation to the typology or the techniques and, and the use. Um, not, I mean, not yet, because I didn't process all the data and I'm still recording. Um, but there are, I mean, yes, for some small shape, uh, which are uh, which looks like tableware. It seems that it's more he four, uh, which is the more quartic one. But he four is also attested uh, in one of the big pithweight uh, cooking jars, so it, it's a bit difficult. However, I mean, uh, Evangelia Kiradzi in her PhD she has shown that type he uh, the fabric he one is uh, very similar to the fabric of the of the pithos of the pithoi, um, but it's a bit. Um, the recipe is a bit different, but it's still the main, uh, the main it's still the, the same fabric. And uh, yes, he four is also very similar to uh, the tableware. Yeah, I mean, um, the others who are doing, uh, other physicians who are doing uh, tableware. Um, yeah, I mean, he four seems to be very, very big, broad uh, fabric. Uh, yeah. Um, King, I, ha I have a question. Um, you mentioned that you want to um, connect um, um, what you found in Thessaloniki with um, other sites in the Balkans to compare different technological uh, traditions, if I understood well. Yeah. So I'm just wondering how you plan to do it because all your cooking pots were made in Thessaloniki. Yeah, uh, so actually I have another site, which is Kastanas, but it's, okay, it's still in Central Macedonia, but it will be... Um, Normally, it was supposed to be also a big part, but then we minimize it because it's a bit complicated to access the material. Um, so I will have another, uh, let's say, window there. Uh, but then for uh, yeah, for the comparison with the Balkans, it will be done through bibliography because it's not possible to do more. I mean, uh, more study there. I mean, it takes more time and. I only have three, four years. I'm trying to finish yeah, in three, four years. So let's stick with, yeah, yeah. I cannot do anything. Yeah, so it will be mainly bibliographic. Yeah. And just a comment, since I'm studying post-medial ceramics from Thessaloniki, it's very nice to see this long continuity <laughs> of the same uh, raw materials, the use of same raw materials. Um, any other question? That's it. Thank, Thank you, you. And I would like to invite Christiana now. Um, any questions for Christiana? <laughs> Basically, it's more a technical question. Uh, have you tried to exclude the outliers? Yes, it's something that I'm planning to do. I haven't uh, had the time to do it, but uh, I tried like multiple. One of the issues first was to choose the data transformation. So I tried multiple data transformation and it seemed that it's, yeah, it's, I, I think it will be better to include them. 
because there's a lot of variability. But I will, uh, it's in my plans to try and do the PCA again so without the PCA, then she's yeah. very sensitive with the outlet. It's yes. not always the case, but yeah, my yes. Mm -hmm. yes, thank you. Um, Christiana, I have um, a question um, about your outliers. Mm -hmm. um, there are several clusters, if I um, uh, uh, remembered well, with this early Byzantine pottery mm -hmm. that are really outliers. Mm -hmm. um, why do you see this picture? What do you think uh, is the context behind? Yes, so one of the theories that we have so far is that during the later period, because as I said earlier, we know that the workshops that uh, were producing the Sagalasso and Tripware stop around the middle 6th century. So later on, we don't know what's happening, but it seems that there is uh, more diversification of the production. So there is more regional production in different centers. So that's why in the chemical and uh, the petrographic data, we see that there are different loaners and different fabrics going on and different chemical uh, chemical compositions but yeah i think it's a uh, it's interesting case especially when we compare it to what uh, theodore presented mm -hmm. it's the same period and uh, mm -hmm. uh, the variability is high for for yes. both uh, sides that uh, well regions that you have studied and can i add something that i know it's also something that we see typologically so it doesn't come as a surprise with the petrographic and chemical data because we see that uh, uh, in the later periods there are like different slipwares that the typology is not yet uh, fixed or established. So it seems that there's something else going on apart from the Sagalasso's red slipware, the later phase, the phase nine. Yes. I have a question. I have one question for yes. Luciana. My question is mainly about the pattern very samples mm -hmm. that you mentioned. So do you think that the fabric used for these vessels is used for other vessels as well, like different types of vessels? At the moment, it doesn't... Repeat the question. Ah, oh, yes, yes. So the question was whether the, the raw materials that were used for the pattern burnish were, if they were used for other wares. Uh, uh, so far, it seems that it's not the case, but uh, the pattern burnish wares that I have is still very limited. So it will be uh, more clear in the future when I will uh, include more uh, samples. Anyone else for Christiana? Thank you, Christiana. Uh, Theodore, if you can join us. Yes, please. I do have a question. <laughs> no, it's uh, more of curiosity. Um, what was your strategy to select these specific samples in Cyprus? Did you try to include all the sites that you knew were from this period, or did you make, of course, you made some sort of selection for your area? Yeah, no. So actually, um, I didn't select the samples. The samples were already made from a previous project. So these were the available um, samples that I had. So I decided to focus on that. They were ready in section, so I had some material to work on right away. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a rather specific question. Okay. Uh, I wanted to know, you mentioned on your slides and uh, talked about the low RK. Mm -hmm. uh, could you explain a bit more what you mean by that? So yeah, that's a very good question. But I'm gonna return that question to you as a potter. Can you really? <laughs> can you really? Well, in a microscopic level, right? Because this is everything based on the orientation of the occlusions, the voids, and things like that. Could you really say if they're using a potter's wheel and it's they're not? rotating the wheel fast enough or they're using a, a turntable. Can you really see the difference in the fabric? I don't think so. But is it, is it full parts or is it full? no, just search. And this is another variable that of course has to be kept in mind that we have a shirt from a very specific part of the of the pot. And as a potter you know that for different parts of the pot, maybe you decrease the velocity of the of the pottery wheel and things like that. But yeah, we see that really weak orientation 
uh, in these uh, thickly potty parts, it, it's very consistent with the plan. So this is why I say most likely it's not on the on the fast potter wheel, but maybe in a different device, rotary device, and based of course with the tradition that Cypress already has in the turntable. Okay. Uh, because you, I mean, presumably you have how many workshops are there? Doing, are there multiple? There are one, one's doing wheel throwing, one's doing hand making with ORD because they're coming from single workshops that might be better in the I'm sorry, come again. I was saying, uh, do you have multiple workshops? Because you have one that's doing wheel throwing, presumably, and one that's doing hand making, or are they doing it in the same? This one, still, we have to we have to look on that because for the fa let's say the fast moving wheel. And well, we have examples from the Theorius cooking box, and we see that we have a workshop that the fabric is very similar to each other. One example from Catalimata of Tom Placoton, and the other one from um, Calabasos, if I'm not mistaken. But this is something, this is why we really need to dig into this Theorius uh, workshop and petrograph petrographic device in order to have an answer. Yes, please. No, because I don't, I don't have the parts. I, I just have the thin sections and shirts. Can you repeat the question? Ah, yeah. If um, Timot asked me about the. Ah, you can ask. Would you like to. Oh, okay. So ask me about the fashioning of the, of the box. And I told him that I don't have the, um, the whole box, it's just shirts. I have a question for yeah. me. Um, so what you presented is like, uh, we see several fabrics per site, which mm -hmm. is really interesting. Um, you know, like this uh, diversity of uh, production. Um, what do you think about um, a craft organization based on these data? Do we have um, multiply workshops um, operating in Cyprus at the time? Why do we see this picture, this variability? So this is something that I said, this is something, this idea was expressed already uh, by other researchers that we have workshops that maybe supply local markets and we can see that based on the fabric vari variability that yeah, maybe that's the case or a hand or a household production for to supply their own needs. But we can see that it's pretty located like um, these fabrics that we see on Trogos, we don't, really see them for the handmade production um, on the western part of Cyprus. So we can, maybe we can say perhaps that we have different workshops, but with a shared, um, let's say tradition in how we make pots. I'm not sure if I answered your question. Yeah, yeah. would you talk about um, regionalization of production um, in this case? Yeah, I still have to work a little bit more on that. You know, to, to be perfectly clear. Can I comment on your question? Yes. I think it is too early to ask this kind of question. First of all, because as you know, uh, the period yeah. is relatively unknown. It's only recently that we start establishing a chronology for the period. So those fragments that the list has been looking at, they are tentatively dated between the late 7th, mm. most, of, most of the examples we showed. Uh, they are very fragmentary, and they, they date between the late 7th and perhaps middle 9th century, that's a long period. And you know, part of the assemblage may be dated to the late seventh. Some other fragments from the same site may be dated to the 9th century. So talking about workshops is, is rather too early to say. So and mm. uh, so there is chose to uh, show uh, what his study has, how his study has progressed on the basis of the cooking pots only. Uh, so in order to talk about what is handmade, what is will made, what is probably slow will made, uh, whether there are different workshops uh, producing different technology, uh, different wares on the basis of the technology of the wheel, uh, he has to compare with the rest of the assembly. There's, there's not just cooking pots, there's also other 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 wares used in the household. So that's that's still to be done. Yeah. Um, if you don't have more questions, uh... yes, Mary, do you have questions? Oh. Ah. <laughs> I would like to thank you all, um, and I think uh, we can move to a lunch break. Uh, thank you.
just a small thing. Uh, anyone who wants to go outside for a quick photo, everyone who wants, we can just go grab a quick snap and, and then go to lunch.